Hello and welcome to the MIG Plus One podcast, where I sit down with industry leaders to discuss the project to product movement. I'm Mick Kirsten, founder and CEO of Tastop, and best-selling author of Project to Product, How to Survive and Thrive in the Age of Digital Disruption with the Flow Framework. I'm delighted to welcome back one of the world's foremost authorities on lean agile best practices, Dean Leffingwell. Dean is an entrepreneur and software development methodologist best known for creating SAFE, the most widely used framework for business agility. Dean has authored many best-selling books, including Agile Software Requirements, Scaling Software Agility, and SAFE Distilled. Dean first joined me on the podcast about a year ago in December 2020. We had a great conversation around Safe 5.0 and the importance of having business agility, abandoning organizational hierarchies, the importance of focusing on outcome-based metrics, and more. Since then, I was thrilled to see Safe 5.1 incorporate the flow metrics and witnessing so many organizations succeeding with deploying Safe and Flow at scale. Dean and I spent a lot of this discussion focused on practices and behaviors of high-performing teams and dug into our own experiences on what makes teams thrive. I asked Dean about the concepts of flow leadership and flow teams and where he sees the future of agile models evolving over the course of the next decade, which made for an absolutely fascinating discussion. So with that, let's get started. All right, Dean, welcome to the Project to Product podcast. It's great to have you back. Uh, you know, I'm always learning and processing everything I hear from you, every conversation that we have. And, and most recently, these conversations have actually uh, come to what the future of Agile, what the future of some of these key roles, what really is happening as we understand more around product innovation, around flow, what you see happening to the industry and to the way that, that we get to, the, to business agility and, and a faster path to, to transformation. So, And I know you actually have some questions for me, so this is going to be a slightly different podcast as, as you warned me, but, uh, but why don't you tell us what where, you know, what's been occupying your mind uh, in terms of, again, having seen every Agile model and trying to map out with all this data and information that you have from all these large transformations using SAFE, what you've learned and what you're concerned with and where you think we're headed. Thanks. Well, you, you know, I spend most of my time worrying about scale, right? So we yeah. talk about lean portfolio management and strategic planning and strategic themes. We talk about the Agile release train. But the heart of what we do in SAFE, and I'm confident that the heart of what you do at TASTOP is based upon the nature, the fundamental nature of a high-performing Agile team. And I moved to Agile in about 2003 or four. I don't remember exactly, when I learned about it and I got to start coaching some teams. And being part of an Agile team is frankly something that I will never not do. It's, it's what motivates me, the, you know, the team has my back and vice versa. And high-performing teams, high-performing Agile teams are the heart of Agile and they always were. So in this discussion, as I was thinking about talking to you again, I wanted to get back, go, go, really go down to basics and, and, you know, shove aside the veneer a little bit and say, I suspect you have high-performing teams because you're performing well in the market and I know you. As we said, we were separated at birth and we've lived these separate lives. I feel that we have some high-performing teams, but they don't all behave the same way. And I just want to explore what you're doing and maybe some of what we're doing to try to lay a little groundwork with a little more open mind about Scrum, Kanban, XP, whatever, and start thinking about what makes today, you know, in 2021, a high-performing Agile team and what we might think they look like in 2025. Because if we lose that, we're going to lose agility. If, if SAFE loses that or shops lose the, the basic empowerment of what I call, the, you know, the expressive ability of an Agile team, then SAFE's not going to work. And I want to make sure that neither of us lose that and the industry doesn't lose that because that's why I started this company to begin with. Wow. Okay. So wh- where do you want to begin? So I want to ask you some questions. So you, you're performing well in the market. The, the tool is well known. We're, we're in the process of putting it to work for us. As you look around your office, and I've talked to you a number of times, both in and out of the office of COVID times, you've got some high-performing agile teams. And I wonder how they work. I wonder if you could describe them in a way that said, they use a model like this or a model like this, or they use pure Scrum, or they're really XP-like, or they're flow-like. What do they do? Are they all the same? Are they homogenous? How do, how do they behave? I mean, how do they think about, for example, events and, and roles? Yeah, Dean, so this is... It's- to me, this has been a, a a really interesting evolution. I think I think like for you. So as a and I'll just go back to the to the start of it in terms of my context. And for me, it was it was ninety nine. It was I was on an agile team who was not calling itself an agile team. We were just calling ourselves an, an open source team. We were an open source team at Xerox Park. 
And then our team lead at that time uh, read Ken Beck's book and got a chance to talk to Ken Beck. And then we all very quickly read Ken Beck's book and I got to learn about the theory of constraints. And then we were applying those and we started calling ourselves an XP team. Right back then, because that was that was the best label yeah. that you could associate. Yeah, that, exactly. That was the best label. And then you know, fast forward, and we we stopped using that label, and we started adapting to some of those practices in our own way. And we learned. And it, over the next, it was really over the course of four years that that I was working with this with this team, and we've evolved a lot of our own practices. And then, of course, we started seeing agile come in and learning more from that. But the the fascinating thing for me is that we've had this. Uh, this maturing collection of practices were safe as I think the, you know, the, the, by far the best body of work of, of effective practices. And of course, we've seen what's happened with, with Scrum and with Kanban. And just philosophically from the start, the way we've approached it as, as Tastap has grown and as Tastap has scaled, uh, as well as, you know, for me, my experiences are with our customers, with our partners, and, and just always being interested in what they do. I've found it effective to just allow the teams to, to choose their, their own ways of working, right? And to choose their practices, right? So the practice of PI planning, I think you're insane not to use them. You need, you need that or something. You have to have reinvented it with different words. It's, it's, it's critical to aligning business planning and strategy to, to agile planning and, and delivery. So, and, and and of course, making sure that you've got this feedback loop that's based on outcomes, not just based on connectivities. So where we are, just fast forward to where we are today, we've, we've taken that approach of, of learning, of adapting these things, and our integration product, Tastop Hub, that's using Scrum in, at the mm-hmm. team level, right? But our uh, very fast-moving Tastop Viz product, which really that team, those, those teams started forming three years ago now, or they're about maybe three and a half. Well, no, it was three years ago. Uh, they don't. So they actually still have someone called a, for example, just there's a very concrete example. There's someone in a Scrum Master role on that team, but what they do is just completely different than you know, their goal here. I'll just read it straight from the, from the documentation here. Um, but their role is to be a facilitator of the standard conversation uh, and to ask what happens to unblock flow and to help basically facilitate the conversation of improving and, ex- and accelerating flow. So that's very different than what some of our, you know, our product that's OEM'd by many vendors and has this other structure and fundamentally has a lar- just much larger base of legacy is doing. So it's just been a fascinating thing to me as these practices like Scrum, we've seen them in, in a lot of technology companies, we've seen them not even in place, yet the concepts of agility and are there. Let's explore a little bit further because at the, the heart of Scrum is the Scrum Master, and I'll share my own experiences on that. But in, in, the, in the teams that are running the Scrum model, that's defined, I, I would guess, that role is kind of defined the way Scrum defines it. But in the teams that are running a more flow-based paradigm, you're using this, some of the same skills. You didn't just say they're off on their own and they don't need any facilitative processes to worry about you know, whether it be, you know, inter-team conflict or coordinating with others or, or, or simply understanding the impediments. So you've taken some of the aspects of the Scrum Master role and in, instilled or inserted those in the teams that aren't per se running Scrum. That's right. But, now, know, have we I, done it exactly the right way? I don't know. It'd be, it'd be great I, to get yeah, your sense so for it, but that, that's, our, that's our factual current state today. It's kind of similar to my discovery. So maybe, I don't know, 10 years or so ago, we looked at the Scrum Master role and the product owner role, and we were rolling Scrum out at big companies, companies that you're well aware with, well aware of. And, and one had maybe a, a thousand or so, you know, very highly technical people. It was basically an operating system business. And we were faced with the problem of, okay, we want to adopt Agile. We want to use Scrum because, frankly, I like it. I think it's an incredible invention. The notion of the product backlog, facilitative leadership, those things are great. But it's like, okay, so we're going to divide into teams of 10 or less. There's going to be 100 of them. And we need a Scrum master and a product owner for each. And you get this blank stare. It's like, yeah. what are those people doing now? They're cutting code. They're writing tests. So I wasn't convinced at the time that the role of Scrum Master was a permanent role. So as we adopted Scrum and Agile and evolved our own skills, both prior to and in the context of scaled Agile, we experimented with it. We tried for a while simply passing the hat amongst our team because, it, oh, yeah. you know, in, in, in theory, people couldn't do this. And we you even still see, do that. you know, right folks, right folks like Mike Cohn write about that. It ended up with Enbar, who is one of my teammates and I, competing for the title of the worst scrum master ever. 
we simply we simply did not have the skills. We, it, it, I can't tell if it was skills, interest, attitude, or aptitude, but we were terrible at it. At the same time, we at one point did a, a very structured implementation of project management tooling with stories and tasks, and we found it was too much overhead. Mm-hmm. So we kind of bailed on both for a while, and we got very much more kind of flow-oriented. But a, a, as we as we did that, we started missing some of the ad backs. And to make a long story short of this piece, we a, added a scrum master, and she's been invaluable. But I would say that her role is more oriented towards the work that we do in the art and the coordination of dependencies and impediments with other teams than it is for our team. Now, she absolutely ably assists our team, but I think her value proposition is much broader than that. So we kind of, in a way, threw in the towel and say, we need that leadership role in our group. And we came to the same conclusion is that we want somebody to do that. And their specialty skills and they're good facilitators and they're trained and they, they, they learn about great techniques for keeping teams dynamic and making meetings good. And they practice icebreakers and they bring fun to PI planning, invaluable. But at the same time, wouldn't say that we apply the Scrum Master role the way it was defined. What about in, in your world then, and let's just say in, in the Scrum team, the events are well-defined. How do the events look like on, on, on the Viz side? Do they do weekly planning? Do they even iterate? Yeah, no, I think the iterations are there. The demos are there. It's just a, it's a faster cadence, but the, you know, there's still sprints, right? There's the, so the, the two-week sprint cadence is absolutely there. And the, I think, Dina, but you mentioned the key thing, like what, what's, what's interesting, what's hard about that cadence, right? Let's say, let's just take a concrete example. With Task Up Vizas, that talk to all the agile DevOps and product and project management tools and the like. So you've got this very significant dependency on our, on our connector code base, right? On that separate yeah. release stream that's a yeah. release stream. And then you, you actually said some of these words, which is exactly how, where we've landed today, which is that, that Scrum Master role, of course, is one of the key things is not, it's not just helping the teams, uh, or that this and it's multiple teams, but they the key role that they have is actually understanding those dependencies. And as part of our planning process, of course, making sure that we're we're managing those dependencies and and that there's that that there's that feedback loop around them and there's the communication and collaboration happening. So with that, and it's interesting, right? Because I think you've probably seen this a lot in a lot of these organizations. Some of the dependencies you'll have dependencies between faster moving teams or teams with 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 more staff and and then slower moving teams, right? As well. So the the key thing is uh, it's just such, such a great when you've got someone good at this that communication is is very effective. And so again, in this role that. And by the way, for us, of course, and the, the way we look at it, I think the way you look at it is, it's all about accelerating flow, which means easing burden, removing bottlenecks, removing those dependencies. You know, what a great role for that. But it is interesting to see that it's the way we think about it is, is probably a bit different than, than the way we thought about what a Scrum Master was a few years ago. You know, you mentioned, or I did, we both did mention the word increment and iteration, right? So an iteration has started to be more of an abstract thing for me. Um, and I, by the way, I think it is in Scrum as well, right? So there was certainly a time where the goal of a sprint was a, you know, potentially shippable increment or new product functionality, but that tended to make shorter, short waterfalls. I think, I think it's clear in the, in the Scrum guide now that you can ship any time. Mm-hmm. What we discovered in our team is that we, we run safe with two week iterations. And that really is a great clock cycle mm-hmm. for the company that plus PI planning, we know how we work. But for, for the, the framework team, we decided that that was too slow. And we moved to one-week iterations. And because there's, they have nothing to do with when you release anything, it was arbitrary. And because it's a subset, you know, it's a subharmonic of two weeks, we did that. Now, we did that for a couple of reasons. One is, is maybe it's silly. In two-week sprints, I can never remember which week I'm in. <laughs> I'm always confused. <laughs> Are we doing planning or not? So we went to one week and we run Monday to Friday. But interestingly enough, we don't have a sprint review. We just deliver incrementally. Yeah. But we do planning absolutely rigorously yeah. every single Monday. And because it's generally not a travel day, back in the old days when we used to jump on the plane, yeah. you would often jump on the plane Monday afternoon, not Monday morning. So we move to one week and be, and and sometimes we we feed a lot of other teams like we feed the uh, you know we feed the learning team with content. So sometimes we're like a faster clock cycle, which is yeah. kind of good. But we align on the two. Now in, in that one of the other reasons we went to that is that the daily stand up has not generally worked for us. 
lots of reasons. We, we teach, we're on the road, we're in the air. And it got to be, there was two people here, not five, and we couldn't keep the discipline up. And we then moved to say, well, if we met more frequently, if we planned more frequently, we'd have higher integration, we'd have higher frequency uh, communication points. So we went, we just evolved this interesting pattern. We do our planning every Monday. It's a 90 minute time box. That's important sync point. But on Thursday, we do a sync point, and that's, again, 90 minutes. And Thursday is not oh. about planning, and yeah. we don't even do story reviews. We talk about, you know, did this get done? We, we release things, articles, stories, every day, pretty much. And we just do that via Slack and says, hey, 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 this is here. Now, when we did that, we didn't really need the DSU anymore because we sync hmm. on Monday and Thursday. And by the way, if some people can't make it on Thursday, and that's often the case, you're only two days away from a sync point. Right. So when we shortened that cycle, we didn't have the rigor of the daily standup. And yet other teams in our company, including uh, including teams that, you know, that, that develop real assets like multimedia are rigorous about the standup because they don't have the same travel requirements. They're not yeah. necessarily teaching in a class. And they use it not for what did I do yesterday. They use it for demos. So they're yeah. kind of like demoing output. Yep. So it's, it's almost like a story release party every single day. So for us, when we made it shorter, our life got easier. And it means that we're more quicker to adapt if we need to. We're less worried about missing a Thursday. We don't have to go, hey, it's Wednesday. I've got, you know, I'm 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 on an airplane or I'm just getting out of bed. Our, our team is across, I think, six time zones. We know how we work. We we work effective that and we have two incredibly important sync points per week. So consequently, we don't need the DSU. Well, if you're not doing a daily standup, you're not really following Scrum. So again, is that not Scrum or is it meeting the intent of Scrum with a slightly different structure? Yeah. So if you ask our team, do you do DSU? The answer would be no. If right. you ask our team, do you constantly synchronize your work in constant communication, address impediments and blocks? The answer would be absolutely yes. So I don't even know yeah, as a quasi methodologist if that's Scrum or not. What I know is that works for us in a way that the off-the-shelf writing, including, by the way, probably in our own articles and certainly in, in, the, in the Scrum world, it, it doesn't describe what we do. What we do meets the intent of what's described, but it's not the same. It's interesting. You just reminded me that the highest performing and output team I've been on, this is sadly a long time ago, but I've been directly on as a, as a, uh, as a coder. And this was partly commercial, partly open source, but weekly iterations no DSUs, basically Monday, exactly as you say, the sync point for the whole team. And then Friday evening, it was at late evenings in this, in this case, we would, and back then this was, you know, today the teams all do, you know, continuous delivery. Like you said, it's the, the, the kind of the, the shipping and the planning are, and are, are, deco are decoupled in this interesting way. So just different. We would actually do daily delivery back then. And this is early 2000s. Oh, no, this is, sorry, this is like 2008. But, and then on Friday, we would actually do a, a, a broader release. This is, and this is working on Eclipse, by the way, the Eclipse tools, uh, so that we have people consuming it and the feedback on for Monday. But it was, it was just so much more similar to what you're describing right now that was actually the highest uh, throughput team I was, I was a, a personally a member of, development team. Yeah, I think we have common experiences there. And yet, if you're starting a team out and you're introducing them to Agile and say, you know, be a high performing team, work your stuff out, figure out how to communicate, deliver every day. Okay, where do you, how do you start with that? So I, I think you've, you've got to provide some structure for people to get started. And we still feel yes. very structured, honestly, but we're disciplined in our structure. But it's not, it's not a model that you could say, they run Kanban, they run Scrum, they run XP. We have aspects of all of that. Even XP, while there's not much bloom on the marketing rows now, the principles around a pair programming and peer review, we don't pair program, but we but we pair frequently. Yeah. So when yeah. we want to work on something, we'll, we'll, we'll do kind of spontaneous pairing. The fact that we have standards, we have quality standards for our work. We use tools, simple tools like Grammarly to make sure we can automate some things. So the principles of XP are definitely with us. No story goes into the baseline without being reviewed. Nothing ever goes into the into the into the framework. I won't write a sentence that hasn't had some level of peer review. So the learnings from XP are here, but mm -hmm. I don't like you, uh, maybe 10 years ago, there are places like, you know, the company Menlo Park, where that was exactly their business model, and they were really good at it. But I don't see that as much anymore. But the learnings from there are also incorporated. So in, in, in I like you, I learned XP first, 
and found it to be incredibly disciplined because if you write the test first or you write yep. it right away, let's be honest, you're going to have good code. So I really like that. And I learned that first, but, but Scrum kind of won that war in terms of, you know, the, the Scrum Alliance, I think did a fantastic job of, of making a, available a routine model that people would adapt and get to agile really, really, really well. Yeah, I've had sense for where this is headed, right? Because we've seen we've seen the technology practices at at companies like tech giants or the the unicorns and the like. And there there is something more, I think, of of what the way that you're describing working to the way that they're actually implementing and scaling agility. So where where do you think this is all headed? So you know, I think people that predict the future are either you know clairvoyants or charlatans, and I like to think I'm neither. But the reality is there's no question about more frequent delivery of smaller batch sizes rules. So if I can use Scrum to do that, and, and for example, the, the team that I just said, you know, demos their work every day, and they have a good rigorous planning model, that's great. If, for example, some of the structures around Scrum, like the DSU, doesn't work for a team, the thing is, are you delivering frequently in small batch sizes? I think, I th- honestly, I think it's the theory of lean and the theory of flow that is the biggest gift that we have. So I think teams are going to move toward, towards a more uh, more flow-like paradigm. But but that's not to say that Scrum doesn't play a role. I, as we've seen, the Scrum Masters, the Scrum Masters certainly are super valuable. They're, they're inherently part of the structure in a safe shop or somebody fulfilling that role. And, and I also see, you know, Scrum evolving at the same time. But I think the, the, the Scrum is, is, is great in some ways because it has a very lightweight definition, but it's also rigorous. And the Scrum Guide says, if you're not doing this, you're not doing Scrum. So we're probably not doing Scrum. And yet we've learned so much from Scrum and XP that we're beholden to it for much of what we do. So th- there's no question that more frequent releases in every, and virtually every environment, now, is, is SAP HANA putting out a release every day? I kind of doubt it. I think right. that would freak everybody out. But I'll bet they're driving towards more frequent updates to that code baseline than they did before. We're all moving that same direction. Now, I'm also, I also don't believe that you know, a, a two-pizza team could build a, a banking system for, that, that works across you know, 27 you know, nations or a, or a satellite or an F-22. So I think we have to we have... To have the, the strength of the small team. I think the new Scrum Guide is just 10 and under. That's a great rule. It has to be a very high-performing team. And then they're going to need to cooperate. So I, I think as people look at safe and complexity, they say, well, uh, Mick, you just said that you you coordinate dependencies. Well, don't you know you shouldn't have them? <laughs> you should have designed. <laughs> what, what the heck are you doing? Yeah. You know, you have dependencies? Well, what, what kind of Luddite are you? Well, the reality is, cooperation is required to build large-scale systems. It's a team sport, and it's not a one-team sport. In our case, it's a many-team sport, and some of our customers have a 100 arts that they consider as teams. So we're yeah. talking, you know, a 1,000 team sport, and that requires coordination and synchronization. So I think we'll continue to get better at, at kind of the team dynamic with whatever label goes from that. I have no idea. And we'll continue to coordinate and find lighter ways of Decreasing dependencies, I think team topologies is a good yeah. a good, good clue for that. That really helps. We'll continue to evolve ways to decrease the dependencies. At the same time, every large system is a system, and it is more than a set of components that accidentally interoperate. I, I think we'll see both. I think we'll see higher velocity at the team level, and we'll see we'll see better and better ways to coordinate with lighter and lighter overhead at the system level. Yeah, Dean, so I, I just want to dig into that a bit because I think I... I Love how you think and articulate of the, the, basically the, the entire organization as the system, right? How you think of, of yep. safe as an operating system for the organization. And I think that, you know, I know my operating system has an activity monitor here and I can look at my network traffic. I see exactly how much megabits I'm, I'm, I'm streaming up right now. And you've, I think that one of the most important, and especially for the kinds of things I care about, which is measuring systems and finding bottlenecks and constraints in systems, the approach you now launched in the past year. It was just a few months ago on metrics and safe, and the fact yes. that you've now got these, what I think are the way of now measuring the system and understanding. You, you mentioned getting better, right? To make the system better, yeah, to make absolutely. dependencies better, to have better alignment between the software architecture, you know, our, our release trains and our team structure, and then of course the business value streams. We need to be able to measure the system. So, 
Could you just speak? And of course, where you end up with is we've got the competency metrics, the outcome metrics, which again is I think where organizations fail is by ignoring the outcome metrics and over focusing on on activities. But you've got the competency metrics, which are key, the outcome metrics, and of course, you know I'm thrilled to see the flow metrics addition here as well. So tell us how and. I do want to make sure you go into this as well, and then we can get back to the, you know, what you've taken away from this in terms of your own learnings of using SAFE for the framework team, as well as, as it continually improving the system, which is, I think, one, one of the key things here, that these measurements actually make sense at the, at the different domains in, in organizations, right? That we need to be able yeah, to understand, absolutely. inspect the system, and then feed back, that back into an improvement loop. But, but tell us a little about, bit about this journey, because I, I feel like this is such a key part of what, where the future is. I'll go back to, oh my, it's 10 or so years or so ago when I was in front of a, a CEO of a highly technical company. He was not a technical person. Most times that's a struggle. He was really good and he recognized what he could do well and what he didn't do. And he basically said, you know, you folks, and there were about a thousand of us, can run the development process however you like, but we will establish measures. And we'll know that we're progressing towards the measures. But it's not for me to say you should measure this. You have to decide and tell me what those are. I thought that was really insightful. Now, over the course of years, we've had a lot of metrics in SAFE. And it's we called it a collage. There were many things you could measure, including flow. And you could you could measure competencies. And, and there were KPIs. And there was key results associated with strategic themes. But there's no comprehensive way to think about the problem. So back in January, we met with, uh, we met with the, the fellows for a virtual offsite, and we threw this out as a problem. And they brainstormed, and they worked in a, in a forum for a while, and they came up with some ideas. And, and some of them were input ideas, and some of them were measuring competency ideas. But one of the most important ideas was also, how do you measure outcomes? So we started thinking about it in those brackets and said, the things that are important to me as an executive, to you as an executive, and to other business owners who don't run R&D, are, are we getting the outcomes we need? Are we growing our skills? And is the process working? So those are the three main areas. So at some point, we had different labels for these. I mean, I think outcomes started as, as KPIs. I think flow metrics might have, be, might have started someplace else. I honestly don't remember. But we resolved at that point that there's these categories that are different. Measuring outcomes is different than measuring your competency. Competency yeah. is not an outcome. Even measuring flow, that's not an outcome. That's a measure of the process that will produce outcomes. So as you know, and we had great discussions about that, we just didn't take you know your book and your word for granted. We went out and we looked at all the metrics associated with flow, and we came to the conclusion that what you had written out, what you had written was a excellent synthesis that modulo a couple things, like the ability to make sure that we're predictable because that's important to us in the safe world, and competency was really good. So we said, that's a great set of metrics for flow. And we've implemented those and we're in the process of my team in terms of where we're in terms of our growth. That's one of the things we're doing now is we're trying to, we're, we're trying to establish better measures for flow and figuring out, by the way, what states are necessary to determine that, right? If, if we decide to hold a thing for a while, that thing is a, a story. Is that story blocked or is it is in a holding pattern called delayed? Well, they're yeah. different things. So we have to sort out those rules. But but having said that, that's kind of next for us to get that is, is to get that part right. So when it comes to outcomes, all of us, every business wants you and I to help them get the right outcomes. For us, that's mostly grounded in KPIs. And I think the state of the art is such is that we're trying to understand how flow can tie to outcomes, how competency improves outcomes. And we're going through a process right now a little bit of internal work to try to correlate competencies to business results because we know the correlation is there, but you have you know you have to prove causality. You have to just say not only is the case that they did it, they got better results, but if they didn't do it, they didn't get better results. So we're you know we're looking with a bit of as far as we can go with metric science to figure to figure that out. But those three areas, outcomes, competencies, flow, you can anchor any enterprise in that, any portfolio in that. And I think you have a unique contribution in looking really, really hard at the flow metrics and coming up with a, a set of five that have definitions. Every definition everywhere in our space is overloaded and arguable, but you put down five and said, we're going to go with this. And we debated those five and said, I think these work. 
who said, okay, great. And we ask your permission, say, hey, Mick, can we just put these in safe? Because it's the best set of organized flow metrics we have. So that's how we got here. But it wasn't with great pride that I've had this incredible vision of how we should measure things over time. I honestly didn't know. And I was more concerned about just getting stuff out the door. And if our customers are getting stuff out the door, their business owners are happy. At the same time, it's like, well, will they get the outdoor next year? And are they getting better at things getting out the door? So it takes a degree of maturity to worry about this set of metrics. But once you're there, and once we kind of look forward and say, well, if delivering value more frequently is important, that's a flow-based statement. we got to be able to measure that. So that's why we kind of ended up in our communication saying that's a really good paradigm. It's a piece of our paradigm. It's not the only piece, but it's a piece of our paradigm that, that frankly, we thought we could borrow with permission and and make good take good advantage of. Excellent. And then, by the way, I just... So I think it's it's great to see, and again, I think having it grounded in your body of work, your experiences is also really helpful because I think that the thing that you identified, Dean, that was actually missing, or you and the team, uh, was flow, flow predictability, right? I, that, that was one I struggled with. I, I knew it was necessary. I did not have enough data at the time right, you know, to compare planned versus actual business value delivered and to understand the, the amount of unplanned work coming into a value stream and so on. So again, I think su- you know, such a key addition that at, at that point in time, three years ago, that again, my sense was it was necessary and, and I'm glad that it's, it, you know, the body of work has been augmented here. So now, Without, without yeah. rolling over into hubris, predictability is, is really important to us in our enterprise. And that's a thing that my team is, is quite good at. We are very predictable. Now, in order to do that, we have to take certain allowances. We have to say there's things we can't commit to because we're yeah. still doing research. But when we make a commitment at the PI boundaries, we always meet it. I think it's fair to say that there's never been one that we didn't agree needed to be changed in the middle because of some change in the business that we haven't met. And when teams do that, it creates a different dynamic. It's like we trust everybody to do what they said they could do in this interval. It's a short interval. It's still research and development, yeah. but people will do this or they'll get back to us right away and say, hey, we've, re- we've hit an impediment or obstacle. So predictability isn't like, oh, we're predictable. Yeah, it is. We're predictable. That means you can count on us. You can build a business with a set of teams that are predictable. And, and if they're unpredictable, you might get a great insight, but you might just blow the next release as well. And you never really know. So predictability is, is, a, is, a, is a critical factor at scale. And that doesn't say you can't innovate. You can innovate predictably. You can say in this next in, in this next interval, we're going to explore this thing, or we're going to build this MVP, or we're going to do a spike. So that that also gets built into the backlog, and it's just just it's just part of what you do to make sure that you're constantly exploring, constantly integrated, constantly delivering. It's just part of the gestalt of not only an agile team but an agile art or agile program. Yeah, I could not agree more. And I think, and Dean, back to scaling, right? I think so many leaders out there are concerned that there's not enough, we're not scaling well, it's, things are not predictable, things did slip. And I think, again, you're experiencing great predictability. I think that the examples that we've seen, and when we see the data, the, the, the flow data for the, in an organization, where, where there's a lack of predictability, we will often see, for example, uh, things like way too much flow load on the team, so they have no capacity for unplanned work that comes mid PI. Or another, by the way, one of the most common ones we see where predictability is adversely effective is mid PI scope changes coming in from yep, yep. business customers and the like. Right? It's, it completely wrecks havoc with a team, especially when they get you know to a level where where everything the team agreed to is now you know has been adversely effective in terms of the the current PI plan. So I think that the thing I love about adding predictability to it. I do want to actually get to the, the different levels of team metrics here. So I want you to talk through that. I thought that was a, such a powerful concept in a moment, but that the, if the team is understanding and measuring and owning their flow predictability or lack of it, then you're having the right discussion to, to understand how do we get more predictable? How, would you, how do we get lower flow time and the like? So Dean, I'm going to pause there for a second because I think that you know, what you've articulated, and, I, and we'll of course uh, link the metrics article from SAFE in the materials, but this way that you've structured it of having the flow, basically flow, competency, and outcomes at the agile team level, at the release train level, and the solution train level, and at the portfolio. And then that's this, I think, really profound statement that you make that these are, these are actually self-similar. These are fractal. We, we, these, these cascade. Can you just talk us through that a bit? Yeah, so we got to be, it's a careful fractal, right? So here's what does work. We can measure flow, outcomes, and competency of any agile release train. That's We can measure flow, outcomes, and competency of any team. But you don't take 
seven teams and measure competency and add them up to the competency of the release train. They're entirely different things. So the notion that it's a fractal is pure, but it's not a cascading integration. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it's not that like they roll up. If, if we have a couple teams that are, you know, not, not very good at, at flow at all, and some that are extraordinary, that doesn't mean you're average. Yeah. It means that you're probably not getting stuff out the door. Yeah. So we we don't actually coach kind of the roll up or the integration, but we do coach the fact that it is a fractal. I can measure that. I can measure that at the portfolio level. For example, there's a portfolio Kanban system. I can measure flow through that system. We can measure the competency because we have a competency around lean portfolio management. And do we measure outcomes at the portfolio level? Absolutely. Those are the KPIs. So these three nuggets of flow, competency, and outcomes apply at all levels, but they're not an integration. We're not taking the spreadsheets and adding six to nine and coming up with yeah. 15. We're saying the answer is whatever the answer is in the context for that team. And I think that's, that's I think, where a lot of people go wrong. And I, I, I bet you discover the same thing. Oh, yeah. Taking three teams with different flow metrics and aggregating them and pretending like that's an answer, it's not an answer. It obfuscates the real issue and basically says, so you're not addressing the root cause right? The root cause is this team needs to improve. But you tell me, I put words in your mouth. I, I, I doubt that you add up flow metrics team by team and say the flow through the enterprise is equal to the summation of these. This is exactly what we've seen with the data, right? So, and I think you, you described the example. I'll give you another one. You've got, you've got 10 teams on a value stream. 10 of them actually have a good flow velocity, the one and, and short flow time. Then you've got one, which is the API team that's, that's actually need to get them the data. And, and it turns out the things that they're delivering have nothing to do with the customer value that was planned for that PI because they're all blocked on that one team whose velocity is, is is poor. So it's so easy. We've had to be so careful, in our, even in our implementation of flow metrics, not to hide what's happening with basically the, at the team level, the shape of the flow, right? Because again, you could have the average can look fantastic and obfuscate more. What we've seen with the flow metrics empirically across our, our customer base, which is you know, the majority of them are uh, safe shops, is that the variability in the metrics for teams, and it'd be interesting to see on the competency and the outcome metrics, I bet it's similar, the variability is very high. Which means yep. if, you, if you're just doing a simple implementation, adding up all the data on a spreadsheet or however you're doing it from a data warehouse and these, these manual ways of, of just these naive ways of adding it, chances are you're hiding the, the actual information because we know two things, high variability of flow data between teams and significant dependencies. And of course, the dependencies are on, tend to be on the bottleneck, which is the, the team that's having the most trouble that wants the most help. So. <laughs> right back to theory of constraints, right? Yeah. The dependencies yeah. are on the bottleneck. We've got five teams that could go fast and one yeah. that, that everybody's dependent upon. Yeah. And if fast teams will go fast, they'll be doing something. It's just that they won't be doing the thing that, that was actually you know, planned as part of that PI or is aligned with a strategic theme. So it's, it's just a, it ha we've actually struggled with this a lot because we initially did do, do too much cascading up without showing enough about yeah. the distribution uh, across at the team level. And then again, from the art to the solution level, right, as well. So. I, I think it, you know this is this is rooted in people want to know how we're doing in the whole, right? So one could argue the system. Do you need to know all that? The problem is, is that when you, you know, the average price for the home in your neighborhood is not what you're going to pay for the house you're going to buy, right? Yeah. You've got to know. You've got to know more detail than that. And I, I think that it's 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 a it's a really big caution. It, we can measure these things at the art level. We can measure at the team level, but the summation of the team does not equal the art, art output. Because a, a bottle, you know, a bottleneck resource. And by the way, in my experience, some of the best teams I've worked with were working on, I guess, what you now describe as a complicated subsystem team. Mm -hmm. And there were bottlenecks and things needed to go through them. And it always seemed slow. There were some of the fastest, most dedicated and strongest teams ever, but they had the biggest problem, yeah. which is everything went through their hands. So yeah. the fact that there isn't flow doesn't mean it's a bad team. It says, wow, they may have too much on their plate. We need to yep. separate out the APIs differently. Exactly. We, need to, we, we may need just two more people in the team because they're working on the, tra you know, the trading system and everything goes through trading and we're two people short and the whole, we could add two people and double the velocity of the team. So you have to know in the, you, the solution lies in the details. Right. Yeah. The, 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 the facts are in the details and has to be addressed in the details. The aggregate, yeah, maybe a law of large numbers means something. But it's not, it's not what these metrics do. So they're fractal in nature, not additive in nature. 
Yeah, exactly. The visual you just gave me is, you know, it's like, and I'm, I'm seeing people do this all over the place with these more naive approaches to metrics. Is it's as if you're measuring the shipping industry, and it looks like all yeah. the boats are moving pretty fast, but you haven't yet noticed because you're doing the averages that there's something in the Suez Canal that's not moving overly quickly, and it's it's the Evergreen, right? <laughs> so, yeah. So, Dean, now this is so in terms of again my own learnings, you know, f- uh, you know, from you here, how we apply this. Uh, the, the flow, competency, and outcomes, I think, are exactly the right model for, for how we should be looking at measuring our teams and driving that improvement, the, the improvement of daily work, which we know is as important as, as the daily work. So how do you think of, this is a question I've, I've been meaning to ask you, um, who, and this actually maybe relates a little bit to the start of our discussion, who owns that, right? Who owns the flow, competency, and outcomes? Because it, we know we need all three. We know high-performing teams are always improving all three. So at, at the team level, right up to the portfolio level, who should own the improvement of those, of those metrics? Well, obviously, the teams, the teams are the only ones that can improve their own performance. Make no mistake about that. But the most interesting question here is the one we haven't talked about is how do you measure outcomes? Right? right. So if, if we create a new article or somebody, or if you put a new feature uh, in Viz, did that change the outcomes? Boy, that's really hard to correlate. And if you try to spend any time tracing from this feature, yep. increase this sales, you're going to spend all your time in analysis, you're not going to get anything done. Yep. So we've tried to elevate that to, to, you know, to KPIs, right? What, what really matters in this business? And as I think about my team and somebody else asked me the other day about how we think about this, we have KPIs, but they're mostly at the portfolio level. So the, the things that we impact are measurable there, right? You know, are, 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 people, are, are, are people attending class? Do the classes get good scores? Are we getting really good feedback from customers? Do we routinely see things in support that are complaints versus supportive? So we, we see and have those because we're close to the portfolio. We're a key element of it. But I, I think when you start to think about anything beyond, for example, you know, a, a key results or, or team objectives, then you start to worry about whether or not that KPI they're measuring at that solution level is really the right one to aggregate up. And I'm, I don't know about that. I think it's highly dependent on what you're building. Yeah. I think my guess is the Viz team has certain types of K, the Viz teams have certain kind of outcomes that are important to them. But the task top team also has certain outcomes, but they're not the same type. That's right. One might be market share, one might be efficiency. So you have to know what the solution is you're building and associate with KPIs with that. But the nice thing is about the solutions in SAFE is they're kind of art-based. Now, a team can absolutely create a solution, but that's probably a single team solution is not not generally that big a thing. So it's probably combined with other things in the art. So you focus on the solution and say, what am I trying to get done with the solution? what's the net promoter score for support for that solution yeah. or what's a net promoter score for the class or is there uptake on the class? Is that class selling? Are people looking at the website? Did anybody click on this new article? Those are the things that, that we look for for our outcomes and they all aggregate up because in the end, the outcomes are success and market share. And, you know, and for many cases, that's profitability and nonprofits. It's, it's whether or not they're serving their constituents, you know, in, in certain governments, it's whether or not they're, they're, they're serving the public well. Those get to be pretty lofty and pretty intangible, and it's pretty hard to say that the feature I did just increased our market share. It's hard to get there, but I can say in my solution, we added this new capability and people are actually using that. So given that they're using that, that's pretty good. Market share may or may not go up. It could be other reasons why I'm losing market share. So those get to be intangible and less connected. So you keep your eye on them, but you got to measure the things that, are, that, that you've got some capacity to change. Yeah, absolutely, and and I think you know, that's exactly how we've approached it. And again, I think what what you're saying here as well is that those outcomes are they're still key at the team level, right? One of the dysfunctions yeah. I've seen is that the outcomes are there at the solution train level, but the teams they don't even they don't know who the customer or the outcome is because the work has right. been thrown over the fence to them still. But pushing the outcomes to the team level, even if it's you know, did anyone use this feature? Of course, then of course did that did that then drive better retention of the customer base? Did that did that drive a, a renewal or or more success with a customer or more happiness with a customer? Those things we can actually connect if we're looking at this kind of correlation based approach rather than again having a, a perfect line from feature to outcome. So teams and arts build solutions, products and solutions, products in your world, solutions and ours. What are those solutions doing? What do we try to achieve with that? And put the measure there. Yeah. And then you've got you've got your process measure. You've got your process metrics, whether you're flowing. You've got your ability to improve metrics, which is competency. And then you've got a set of outcomes that are local to you and meaningful, as opposed to yeah, you know, that floats at the port. We want more market share. I don't know what a team does about that. 
it, it, it's going to take a lot of teams working very effectively to actually increase market share if that's the goal. Exactly. So Dean, I'm going to now have a, a big question for you. Uh, is your charlatan comment that made me think of this? Because I, I, I do not see you as a... <laughs> I know you're not a charlatan, but, uh, but Alan Kay, person behind Smalltalk and just an amazing, I think, thinker, he did, he did say, and I remember hearing this, uh, the, the best way to predict the future is to invent it. So, so it's think, think towards to 2025 or that, you know, that kind of five-year time frame. What do you think, and knowing what you know, which is, I think, more than most of us do, and the way that you've seen these kind of agile methodologies, team structures, practices, and the like evolve, what, what do you think will happen to, to what agile teams look like in the back half of this, of this decade? Well, I think there'll be agile teams. I mean, we've been at this almost 20 years now, and probably if you look across the industry, only a small percentage of people, even in development, are on agile teams. I mean, it might be a third. I, I don't really know. But as you start to think about the agile enterprise, you start to think about, well, this mo model of empowerment, kind of local backlog management, facilitative leadership, commitment to an objective, cooperating in the larger in the larger sense, that's going to be across business. So I think you're going to start to see agile businesses. And we're already working with, you know, we've got we've got agile marketing programs. We've got some people right now trying to understand what's it like to be an agile sales team. Do you do daily stand up? Do you have a backlog? Can you accept new work if it's a new order? Absolutely. So I think you're going to see business agility grow out of that. Yeah. I do not foresee a time when a small group of people working together who trust each other and are committed to an objective isn't the fundamental building block of success. If that happens, well, I'll be past my time for sure, but I just don't see that. I don't see, is there a replacement for team level agility on the horizon? I sure don't see it. I think we've got to get better at what we do and whatever evolves will evolve through here, right? It's going to evolve from our current practices and processes. I don't see what that quantum jump would be. I don't know where you'd go. I, I, one of the things I liked about your book is you went back to the first principles of lean, and those have informed me for decades. Those are still true, right? Smaller batch sizes, elimination of waste and scrap, focus on the delays. Will there ever be a time that we're not doing that? I kind of doubt it. Is there a time when our systems are going to get less complex? No. They're getting smarter. They got AI in them. They have to be monitored. They make decisions. We have to be involved in that. I don't think we can ever be less agile. I don't, I don't see a way out of this. I, and I think that we'll continue to have systems that are bigger than us and they're just could soon be smarter than us. And we're going to have to be, be very agile and be very smart to keep up with them. Awesome. And I, I, will, I will venture and say, uh, in terms of uh, predicting the future by inventing it, that at each of these levels, outcomes, flow, and competency will be the way that teams measure and improve themselves. Well, it's a fairly new handle, and we're certainly going to give it a shot, both of us, right? Yep, and uh, and I yeah, and I think that will last. However, team structures evolve when they become more yep. flow oriented. Leadership roles yeah, change. Yeah, will, out will outcomes ne ever not matter? Yeah, no, no, exactly. Does the ability to deliver value quickly matter? No, does the ability to improve always matter? Yes. So I think there's a pretty persistent labels that we could hang on to for a good a good five years at least. <laughs> exactly. That's all. Yeah. That's what we need as a stage. So okay, Dean, amazing. Thank you. Any and I think Thanks. again, this is actionable today, which is I think why why it's so important that yep. people take a look at this metrics article, understand how safe has evolved, and then anything else that you want us all to pay attention to in terms of uh, future evolution of the framework and everything. Yeah, I want a, a, a note to leaders. Think back a time when you were when you as an individual, a practitioner, or a manager were led by somebody who didn't have a fundamental understanding of the space. Think about how miserable you were. Okay. Think I about yourself as a leader and make sure that we stay ahead of this game and that, that, we, that we don't become ossified with all ways of working. So continuous learning leadership, having leadership lead, which is what we're, you know, what we're paid to do is, is critically important. And that requires continuous learning because this market is moving really fast. So we're, we're all in a, in a race to, to gain knowledge as fast as the market is changing. So we cannot rest in place. So a, a note to leaders, go to Gimba, get out of the office, go back, take an online class, pick up two good books, have a book club, do something to make sure that you're the knowledgeable people that you're, that the people who you lead will respect for your knowledge. And that, that it's just a lot more fun that way. That, I've got shivers. That is amazing. Could not agree more. Yeah. Thank you so okay, much, good. Dean. Hey, thanks for having me, Mick. I always enjoy these. Huge thank you to Dean for joining me on this episode. For more, follow me on my journey on LinkedIn, Twitter, or using the hashtags Mick plus one or project to product. Dean's Twitter handle is at Dean Leffingwell. If you want to learn more about the Flowmetrics and Safe, go to tasapp.com slash solution slash safe 
or Google for safe metrics, and that'll actually take you straight to the Scaled Agile Framework website. I have a new episode every two weeks, so hit subscribe to join us again. You can also search for Project to Product to get the book, and remember that all author proceeds go to supporting women and minorities in technology. Thanks, stay safe, and until next time.